Welcome to View from the Top, here from the Beverly Hills Hotel in Los Angeles, and I'm here with Bob Iger, President and CEO of Disney. Bob, welcome. Thank you. Let's talk about your strategy online. You've been very bold in putting top-notch content online, and many people would say, isn't this possibly cannibalizing? Uh, is it uh, possibly proposing a threat? to your uh, business? Well, digital media has created some really uh, important platforms in terms of um, where people are going to access uh, media, whether they're being entertained or informed, how they're spending their time. And we felt strongly about being in that space, which has now grown to well beyond just dot-com sites, um, equivalent of fishing where the fish are. Um, we believe that people will spend more and more time on these new platforms regardless of whether we're there or not. So we thought it was important for us to be there. It also um, is a means of maintaining brand relevance and of innovating uh, by um, not allowing yourselves to uh, be relegated to just the old platforms and the old ways your content was accessed, but by being in new places as a way of portraying your brand, portraying your company and its product is much more modern and, and more relevant. We thought that was important. And also a strong message internally as well as externally. Yes, you're, when, you, when, you, when, you, when you put your product on new platforms, you're in many ways challenging the status quo. A status quo that creates a lot of value, but a status quo is not a strategy as far as we're concerned because the world is changing. The problem when you go into new platforms is that you're, you're in, and in challenging the status quo, is you're viewed as being um, threatening or creating threats to your current business. And while the, it's important to be mindful of that, you can't let that overwhelm you from a strategic perspective. Um, you have to uh, be willing to take risks even with your current business. And also potentially causing tensions with your just distributors, traditional uh, business partners? We have very good, very valuable relationships with many distributors, uh, big box retailers, uh, uh, television station owners, uh, multi-channel providers in cable and satellite, movie theaters for that matter. Uh, relationships that have created value and will continue to create great value. But we can't, can't allow those relationships to get in the way of um, the company adapting to a changing world from a consumer perspective. And it's delicate because by going after, I'll call it the, the future when it comes to the consumer, uh, you're basically creating threats to uh, a lot of the current relationships and the current businesses. But it's still something that I feel companies like ours have to do. And you create, had an app ready for the iPad on day one. Tell us a little bit about how you think the iPad is going to uh, change consumer habits. We had multiple apps ready uh, to launch on the iPad day one, and we did so for a lot of reasons. One, we believed in the platform. I'll come back to that. Two, it was a means of showing to consumers that we were innovative and willing to take risks. And third is we wanted to be there first because we wanted to learn the quickest from how the consumer would use that platform. And we've been blown away by the success of the platform and by the quality of the experience that it provides. It's pretty interesting to have mobile media that is of that quality, high quality video on a great screen as a for instance. To be able to use it to listen to music, to play games, to surf the internet, uh, to do email, and uh, to watch television and movies and a variety of other things. It's one of the most multi-purposed um, consumer electronics product we've ever seen. The other thing that's very interesting about it is that the touch screen uh, takes the friction out of accessing content. People don't realize when you use a mouse and when you use a cursor, it actually adds a little friction or a barrier, albeit a small one, to entry or to access to something. And when you take that away, and all you have is the touch of a finger to start an episode of Modern Family from ABC, that's extraordinary in terms of the power of access for the, that, we, that that device gives the consumer. And so because the, you're dealing with a virtually frictionless environment, the ability to make available product to the consumer is heightened. And it becomes a much more engaging, much more compelling platform than those that we've seen before. 
Okay, let's talk a bit about social networks now. You've been uh, a pioneer in this area too. Uh, tell us how that's changing your, uh, how the use of social networks is changing your business model. Well, for the first time, almost in the, in the history of the company, outside of our theme park relationship, uh, we have an ability using technology to have a direct relationship with our consumers. To either sell to them, uh, or to market to them, or to learn or hear from them. And social media is a great example of that. It's a platform that enables us to do commerce. It's a platform that enables us to market. It's a platform that enables consumers to actually comment about our product and market that product to their friends. So you have a very powerful recommendation engine that didn't exist a scant few years ago. And being in that space effectively is an important part of our marketing strategy as a company. And in the uh conversation we've just had at the Business of Luxury Summit, you talked about the, the tension between essence, the essence of the brand and the company and the heritage and tradition, and the imperative of innovation. Uh, you made as CEO two big acquisitions, Marvel and Pixar. Tell us how those two acquisitions have helped Disney uh, innovate. Well, there are similarities uh, to both, and there are also some dissimilarities. On the similar side, you had at both places a culture of creativity, and the value that Pixar created and Marvel over time came mostly from great creative uh, ideas and great creators, and the ability to take what was created and, in effect, make more of it. A comic book becomes a movie, which becomes a video game, which becomes a theme park attraction, and so on in Pixar's case, an animated film um, that moves across so many different businesses at the Walt Disney Company as an example. Um, relationships with characters and stories and worlds that have been created that are of great value to the consumer that is accessing them. Just memorable experiences in both cases. And that's what the Walt Disney Company is all about. It's creating great stories and great characters and uh, great worlds that um, are evergreen in nature, meaning they live a life, lifetime and then some, multiple generation. They are universal in their appeal across the world and they are leverageable across so many different platforms, existing ones and ones that we haven't even seen created yet. And so the essence of Pixar, Marvel and Disney were very much uh, similar. And that's why you paid big bucks for both. Well, we've been focused a lot on growing the company uh, in that exact way, which is uh, create great experiences, uh, leverage them over time, uh, over uh, uh, territories, and over uh, technology platforms. And we've, we've focused on just that. And we've also been very focused on brand uh, support, uh, brand growth, and brand creation. And so as we look at Disney today, we see Disney and Pixar, ESPN, ABC, and Marvel as the real essence of the company. And so those acquisitions were consistent with not only everything that Disney was, but everything that Disney is today and everything that we believe Disney should be. And you talked about ESPN. I made a private vow that I wasn't going to talk about the World Cup after that uh, indifferent English performance on Saturday. But on the other hand, Bob, ESPN at least showed the English goal, unlike a certain British television company on Saturday night. Well, I, I feel your pain a bit, but although your pain is kind of my gain as a, as a, a fan of the U.S. team, um, it's funny that um, uh, I guess while the Brits were uh, um, running a commercial and not running the U.S. goal, the only U.S. goal, the tying U.S. goal, as a matter of fact. You're rubbing uh, it in, Bob. ESPN was, you was you not wouldn't. doing that, but I also just sent an email to George Bodenheimer, who runs ESPN, asking to tell me what the economics of the event were on ESPN because I hadn't seen any commercials. <laughs> so when I saw that, um, I guess the, the UK lost the opportunity to see that go live because of a commercial, uh, that might necess not necessarily have been a bad thing <laughs> because at least it was commerce. Bob Iger, thank you very much for doing View from the Top. Thank you very much, Lionel.